Now, you got your Bibles, notebooks out. I want to share with you quickly. We're busy with a series on the promises of God, and I want to continue with that this morning. If you missed last week, you can, you can get it online. Uh, I'll recap just very briefly for us. And um, so we said that there are thousands of promises in, in the Word, and they made for you and me. And if we don't know about the promises or we don't know how to attain the promises, we're robbing ourselves. It's almost like having this bank account with more money in it than we can ever really use. And it's in our name and it's available to us, but we don't know how to obtain it and, and, and how to have access to this, this bank account. And so it's important that we understand the promises of God and, and how they work. Now... When someone makes a promise, there are two things that we've got to check. Character and ability. Character and, and ability. Who is this person making the promise? So in other words, do they have character? Can I trust them to keep their promises? And then are they able to keep their promises? Do they have the ability to do that? And so we said last week, the power of the promise is in who's making the promise. So if it's a little one at school making a promise, well, we know they, can, they don't have the ability and they could change their mind. But if it's a trustworthy person, a person of character and integrity, and so we spend quite a bit of time on that, just looking at what does Scripture say about God keeping His promises? What is His track record? And so we, we spend some time on that. We also looked at the two different types of promises that we get in the Word. We get conditional promises and unconditional promises. An unconditional promise is, is a promise where God is going to do or not do something regardless of, of what we do. There, there's no condition that we've got to try and fulfill. And the example that we used was Noah and the flood where God said, I'll never do that again. I'll never cover the entire earth and wipe out the, the, the entire inhabitants of this, this earth that way. I'll never do that again. It's an unconditional promise. And then so many of the promises in the Word are the conditional promises where God says, if you do this, then I will do that. And the example we use is, if you honor your mother and father, listen carefully, Stephen, if you honor your mother and father, you will have a long life full of blessings. All right, and so there's a very definite condition to that uh, promise. All right, so conditional, unconditional promises. Now, how many of you have a promise? There's a promise that you've been holding on to for a long time, and, and, and you, you know the promise. How can I see hands? How many of you have a promise? All right, that's good. And for some of us, it's a favorite promise. One of the first promises, one of the first scriptures I memorized was a promise that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him called according to his purposes, Romans 8, 28. And so that's, that's a promise. And for me, it's been a great promise throughout the years because whenever I face something that I don't understand or something that's unfair or something that's gone wrong in my mind, man, I just got back to that promise. God's going to cause it to work out for, for my good. God is somehow going to use this to my advantage. And so it's good to have that. There, there are many other promises. What about the promise in Romans 8 verse 39 that nothing can separate me from the love of God? I, I'm eternally secure. Uh, anything is possible to those who believe. That's another promise. Or commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him and He will help you. So we bring whatever we're busy with. We say, God, I, I, wanna, I need you to get involved here. Lord, I'm trusting you in this situation. God's going to help us. It doesn't mean our plans are gonna, it's going to be fulfilled, but God gets involved. When, when you open your, 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 your life and your plans for God to get involved, Scripture is saying, I will get involved. And so there are so many powerful promises in God's Word. And Maybe you have a favorite, maybe you don't, but I trust that after this service this morning, you're going to start seeing God's Word in a slightly different light. You're going to start, start looking for the promises and realize that they're there for, for you and me. 
You know, one of the best ways to get to know God, by the way, this is, I'm just throwing this in, is through, through the promises. Because if you think about it, when somebody makes a promise, let's say it's a boss that says to you, if you reach a certain target, I'll send you on whatever holiday, all expenses paid. What does that tell you about that boss? It points toward their generosity. And so it's exactly the same with God. When you start reading through the different promises, it, it points to the, the, the different aspects of God's character. So for instance, where Scripture says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, it points to His commitment and His faithfulness. What about delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart? Points to His generosity. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What, what, what does that reveal of God's character? His love, but also His forgiveness. And so whenever you and I get into God's Word, it just highlights another aspect of, of His character. So this morning what we're going to do is, I, I want to try and answer three commonly asked questions with regards to, to promises. And we're going to put them on the screen. I'm going to give you all three up front. This is where we're going this morning. This is what I'm going to try and answer for us. Are all the promises for us? Can anyone claim the promises of God? And when does a promise become mine to claim? So let's look at that first one quickly. Are all the promises for us? And the answer is no. No. For instance, the promise that God made to Sarah that she'd have a child by the age of 90. How many of the ladies would like that promise? <laughs> nah, it's okay, Leonard. It's okay. It's fine. Let, you know, we let that one go. All right. That was a specific promise made to Abraham and Sarah in a very specific situation. What about Joshua? When God told them if they'd walk around the, the walls of Jericho, the city of Jericho, that God would give that city into their hands again. Very specific promise made to specific people in a specific situation. What about the promise that God gave the children of Israel that He was going to give them their own land called Canaan? That land is also referred to in Scripture as the promised land because God promised that to them. And so let me just say to you, that land, by the way, just by the way, still belongs to them today. Because God's given them that land. And so it doesn't matter what the Palestinians say. It's their land. You better just leave it because God has given them that land. All right. And so some of these promises don't apply to us. They were not given to us. But they were given for us. They were not given to us. But they were given they were given for us. Now, now, what does that mean? Let me explain quickly. Those promises were made to specific people in the Bible. But as you and I read the Bible, it shows, it points again toward God's faithfulness, toward His love, toward His commitment. And as we read that, guess what happens? In turn, it builds our faith. And so these promises weren't made to us. They were made to other people, but they were made for us because it builds our faith. We get encouraged when we, when we read them. And this is exactly what, what Paul was telling the church in Rome. He writes to the church in Rome and he tells them about Abraham and about the promises God had made to Abraham and how God kept those promises. And so he's basically saying to the church in Rome, those promises weren't made to us, but they made for us. We learn from them. Listen to what he says here in Romans 4. He says, it was recorded for our benefit too. It was recorded for our benefit. It, it's in Scripture so that you and I may, may glean from it. Now, fortunately, there are many promises in the Word that are made to us. And for us. All right. 
Let's quickly look at the next question. At number two, can anyone claim the promises of God? Can anyone claim the promises of God? And again, the answer is no. Because the promises of God are for the children of God. There are, of course, one or two exceptions with regards to salvation. Where God has made a couple of promises to the unsaved. And so, for instance, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord and confess with our lips, then we'll be saved. All right, so those are some specific promises that God has made to, to, uh, to the unsaved people. They, 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 they belong to the unsaved. And so the moment an unsaved person claims a promise like that, we say they get saved, they, they get born again. And so they become uh, 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 children of promise, you could say. They become part of the covenant. They become covenant children or children of promise. Not only the promise of salvation and eternal life, but all the promises become theirs. And so the promises of God belong to the children of God. An unbeliever cannot come and say, uh, you know, to claim a promise for, for provision. Lord, this is what you say in the Word. They can't do that. You say, but Leonard, that's a little bit harsh. I know. <laughs> I know. But if you think about it, just, just, just think about this. God has made every single man, every single woman. And His desire, Scripture says, is for all men to be saved. So in other words, for all people to be part of His family. That's His desire. And so when you and I decide not to follow God, not to serve God, basically we are choosing to live outside of His will, outside of His ways, and outside of His, of His promises. In a way, it's, it's a form of rebellion. And, and we're choosing to do that. We're saying, God... I don't want to serve you. I don't want anything to do with church and, and that stuff. And, and God's like, okay, okay. But you need to know, you are choosing to live outside of my promises. You see, my children don't enjoy the same benefits and privileges as the neighbor's children. Nor do the neighbor's children enjoy exactly the same benefits and, and privileges as what my children do. Because they're outside of our family. And so that's where you and I have got to make up our mind. Are we a part of God's family? Because if we are, if we belong to God, then the promises belong to us. It's as simple as that. All right. Now, some people are so poor, the only thing they have is money. <laughs> they don't have God. They don't have the, the promises of God. And so... The unsaved, you could say, are poor compared to us. It doesn't matter how much money they have. If they don't have Christ, they don't have much at all. And so somehow, we've been conned to believe that money is everything. It's everything. And of course, yes, it makes life a whole lot more comfortable. It makes life a whole lot easier. But there's so much more to life than just money itself. Think about what a rand was worth 40 years ago compared to what it's worth today. Oh man, I don't even want to go there. Think about what a promise was worth 40 years ago and what it's worth today. You say, what do you mean? Well, I want to argue, this is how I see it, that a promise is worth more today than it was back then. Because you see, as you and I begin to grasp the meaning of life, and I say begin to grasp, because I don't think we, we get the, the real meaning of life. But there's no doubt about it. As we get older, we begin to grasp the real meaning of life. It's not about money. It's not about things. It's about our relationship with God, and His people, and His promises. 
And so as we begin to grasp that, guess what happens? We begin to value that more. Our relationship with God and His people and His promises. And so that's why I can say, I think God's promises are worth more today than what they've ever been. And so the promises of God are for the children of God. But there are two things that can prevent us from claiming a promise. Number one is where you don't fulfill the condition of the promise. So, for instance, if you haven't honored your, your, your mother and father, and, and take note of that, Stephen, write that down. You know. If you haven't honored your mother and father, all right, you can't claim that promise. Here's the second reason uh, that maybe we can't claim a promise is if there's sin and disobedience in our lives. So let me show you from Scripture, and I'm going to show you Old Testament and New Testament quickly. In Isaiah 59, it says, Listen, the Lord is not too weak to save you, and He's not becoming deaf. So there's nothing wrong with His hearing. He can hear you when you call, but there is a problem. So in other words, we think God isn't hearing us. It's not His hearing is not the problem. Here is the problem. Your sins have cut you off from God. And because of your sins, He has turned away and will not listen anymore. And so what Isaiah is saying, the problem is not God's hearing. The problem is when there's sin in our lives. Now, please let me just clarify something. Sin doesn't separate us from God. All right? Please hear this. It doesn't mean if you're saved today and then, and then get involved in some kind of sin, you're not saved anymore. It doesn't separate you from God, but it prevents your prayers from being heard. It prevents your prayers from being answered, and so we, we've got to know that. It's almost like when, when a child is just disobedient and doing their own thing, and then they come to the father and they say, Daddy, can we do this? <laughs> and the daddy is like, Ek het niks gehoor nie. All right? I, I, you know, don't, don't come in with all your nonsense and now think you can come and ask something, all right? And so it, it doesn't separate us from God, but it prevents our prayers from being heard. Let me show you from the New Testament. In 1 Peter chapter 3, in the same way, you husbands, and he's going to give us two instructions, by the way, must give honor to your wives and treat her with understanding as you live together. So here are the two instructions. He says, honor your wife. Honor your wife. And, and treat her with understanding. It's almost like, oh God. <laughs> You've made her so complex. <laughs> Why? <laughs> now I must try and understand her. <laughs> he says, yes. I want you to honor her. Try and live in understanding. So in other words, not all about you. She's got needs. She's got wants. Try and understand her. Be sensitive to her. Be respectful to her. That's what, what the word is saying now, now, now. He says if you don't do that, he says, he says you, you're disobeying my word. And don't think I'm going to listen to your prayers. Listen to what it says. If you don't treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. It's as simple as that. And so sin and disobedience prevents our prayers from being answered. Let me give you another verse. Verse 12. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. And His ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns His face against those who do evil. And so when a person is living in, in willful, deliberate sin, they know it's not right, but they keep on doing that. They forfeit the right to claim the promises. God's not even going to listen to their prayers. And so obedience is one of the keys to receiving His promises. Now listen, when you and I give our lives to God, we become we become born again, uh, we, we, we get saved, you can use all these different terminologies, but it, it simply means 
that God has forgiven us. The past has been wiped away. We're eternally part of His family. All right? And, and, and so now the, 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 the promises belong to us. And so it's, it's an incredible thought. Since I've gotten saved, I'm part of His family. I'm, I'm eternally secure. My past has been wa- wiped away. The promises are mine. Like, wow! But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you and I can live any way we want to. As a child of God, we've got a responsibility to live as a child of God. It's very important. And let me just say to you, it's not that hard. It's not like, oh man, now I've got to stop doing that and stop doing this and stop. No, no, no. I don't want to do some of that stuff anymore. I just don't want it because God's been so good to me. When I focus on His love and His forgiveness, look at what He's already done for me. And I look at His grace upon my life and all the promises that that He has. What does that show me? Just, Just His heart and how He wants to bless me and how He wants to be good to me. The, the, the more I get to know God, the less I want to do all of that stuff. And so that's why I can say today, it's not that hard to want to live in obedience to God's Word and want to honor God because, because He's just been so good to me. And so that's why we serve Him, and that's why we're obedient to Him. Not because, oh, I have to, and He's not going to listen to my prayers. <laughs> it's because I want to. Because He's a good, good Father. When that, when that revelation becomes a reality in our lives, oh, I'm telling you, something happens. All right, let's quickly move on to the last question. When does a promise become mine to claim? When can I claim a promise? It's very simple. You can claim a promise when it fulfills a personal need in your life. That's if there are any personal needs, by the way. All right? So if there's a need in your life, you can claim that promise. Because let me say to you, and here's the good news today. For every problem, for every challenge, for every obstacle that you may ever face, there's a problem to match that and to bring you safely through. And so when you and I have have problems and challenges, we can go straight back to the Word. Listen, God's promises have been deposited right here in God's Word. They've been laid up. For who? For God's children. For you and me. Because He knows we have needs in our lives. God knows. They're going to have needs. They're going to have challenges. They're going to have problems. Let me give them promises to match that. So, for instance, if you have a need for provision, what is the promise? He will supply all my needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. If you have a need for wisdom, you're going to make some big decisions and you just don't know. I often find myself there. (laughs) There's a promise in James chapter 1. If anyone needs wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously. And so I've been praying that prayer. God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Probably, I'm telling you, when, when I was Stephen's age, in my early 20s, I've been praying that prayer. Just, God, give me wisdom. I need wisdom. If anyone needs courage, (laughs) living in a a day and age that we do, we need courage. Bible says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, God's with you. And so for some of you, Joshua 1 verse 9 that's a promise that you've got to hold on to. For every, for every problem that you and I may face, there's a, there's a promise in the Word. So there's a problem, there's a promise. And what brings those two together? What is the glue to bring these two together? Faith. Faith. So you hear about the promise you learn about the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God and it stirs your faith on the inside. 
But I have a problem over here, and because my faith is stirred up, those two things come together. And so that's what I'm trying to do today. The Bible says in Romans 4.16, the promises, the promise is received by faith. And so this is how we obtain a promise. You've got to be a, a, a child of God, living in obedience to God, putting your faith in God. You've got to be a child of God, living in obedience to God, putting your faith in God, because faith becomes the glue. And so I've shared these things with you today because I don't want you to live in promised poverty. What is promised poverty? Where the promises are there, stacks of them, thousands of them, but you don't know about them. Or you know about them, but, but you don't know how to claim them. Or they're all there and you know about them, but your faith hasn't been stirred. You don't have the glue to bring the promise and the problem together. Or there's sin in your life, and God's been speaking to you about that, and it's blocking the promises from flowing, the blessings from flowing into your life. And so that's promise poverty. It's like having this huge big bank account, more money than you'll ever need, but you don't know how to access it. It's not helping you one single bit. Now, what if, what if you've been trusting God for a promise? You've been claiming a promise, and as Christians, we sometimes refer to it as, I'm standing on the promise, all right? That's all it means. There's a promise. I'm claiming that promise. I'm standing on the promise, but it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. How, how, do you, how do you handle that situation? Well, I remind myself of two things. Whenever that happens, and it happens often in my life, where I'm standing on a promise and, and it doesn't happen, I just remind myself, it may not be His timing or He may have something better. Let me just say to you, there, there's something that you've got to settle in your heart the, the, there's, a, there's a question you and I have got to answer for ourselves. Do I want God's will in God's time, which is perfect, or do I want my own thing? You've got to answer that for yourself. Because you may be asking for the right thing. So in other words, it's God's will but it's not His timing yet. Whatever you do, don't rush it. Don't get impatient. The one who's created time is the one who controls time. He knows the past, the present, and the future. Trust Him. Trust Him. When the time is right, He's going to bring the best into your life. And so you and I have got to settle this thing in our hearts. Do I want His will in His time, which is perfect? Or do I want my own thing? Settle that in, in, in your heart. Listen, friends, there's no one who knows your future better than God. There's no one who can supply your needs more adequately than God. And there's no one who loves you more dearly than God. There's no one who has a better plan for your life than God. And so if you'll obey Him and trust His timing, <laughs> so in other words, be patient, God is going to bring the right thing at the right time into your life. Amen? More of this next week. Come, let's stand. I want to pray for us. I want to give you an opportunity this morning. I just, I just feel, I, I don't want you to walk out of this place 
if there's stuff in your heart, in your life, that's not right, if there's, there's sin, and, and, and I, don't have to, I don't have to labor this thing, and I'm, and I'm not going to do it at all, because God's already spoken to you. So as I've been speaking, that thing has just popped up, and you know it's not right. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning. You can do this at home, but I want to give you an opportunity right here just to come and to say, Lord, you've spoken to me about this thing again. And I want to respond to you this morning. I'm confessing my sin. The Bible says if we confess our sins, we say, Lord, I'm guilty. I'm sorry. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. You want to open the channels of, of between you and heaven this morning. That's the thing. You come and confess that. You say, God, this thing is wrong. Whatever I've been involved in, whatever, my, I, I'm not forgiving somebody. I'm just mad. I'm just, I'm just angry. And, and I'm justifying it because they did and they didn't and they have and they haven't. God says, you're walking with bitterness. Don't think I'm going to answer your prayers. I'm giving you an opportunity this morning to sort this thing out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for speaking to us this morning. We come before you, each one of us, we just want to acknowledge if there's something, something wrong, something that you've highlighted this morning, we want to come and say, yes, Lord, guilty is charged. I come and admit, I come and confess, this thing is not right. My attitude hasn't been right. What I've been doing hasn't been right. And from today, I'm not just going to confess, but I'm going to change that. I'm going to make it right. Thank you then also, Father, that I can know that the channels between me and heaven are wide open from today. Thank you that you are a good, good Father, and you want to bless your children. Amen. Amen. Bless you.